Welcome to The Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. I'm Marianne O'Hotter. Thank you for downloading this edition of The Why Factor from the BBC, a programme that seeks to find out why we do the things we do. Who's this? This is Jaeger. She's a four and a half year old German Shepherd. <laughs> And she knows what's yeah. in the pocket. Oh. It's her favourite toy, so we just sort my harness out. Sort the out. I'm in Essex in South East England with a dog called Jaeger. She's a trained man trailing search dog and she helps the police find missing people who may be in trouble. She knows now because Ina's putting the harness on. Well, she knows before already. So that's a, a woolly hat a woolly that hat. someone's so been that wearing. Been wearing yeah. So the woolly hat so owner not. is the person we're looking for. Okay. And I've let the dog sniff the article. And so she's now got that scent in her head. And now she's got to find that scent on the floor and around the floor. This is the Y Factor on the BBC World Service. I'm Marianne O'Hotter. This week, dogs. Whether you love them or hate them, it's undeniable that we have a close and complex relationship with man's best friend. Have they always had a special place in our lives? And if so, why? When she's running like that, she's hunting for it. Jaeger's just running through the grass, sort of a fairly brisk trot, powering through the grass. I mean, there's no obvious trail here, but she clearly knows where she's going and it must be that she can smell that person. (laughs) Jaeger and her handler, Ian, are part of the canine unit of the Essex Lowland Search and Rescue Team, The team are all volunteers, but train long hours so that if the authorities need them, they can be relied on to track missing children and vulnerable adults in distress. Jaeger has around 300 million olfactory receptors in her nose, compared to my 6 million, and the bit of her brain devoted to analysing smells is massive. It means she can read the landscape in a way I simply can't and follow the unique scent of one human for upwards of 7 kilometres. As soon as you put the head up, like you just saw there, yeah. it's what we call a negative. That tells the handler it's not in that direction. Oh, right. Go in that direction. And have you trained her to do that? They do that naturally. Oh, right, OK. Karen Lee heads up the search and rescue dog unit in her spare time. Her day job is training victim detection and explosives detection dogs for security forces around the country. My dogs, my, especially my Malamar, is my partner. We are a team. Um, You have mutual respect for your partner because otherwise you can't work together. Karen's favourite dog, Cedric, is a feisty Belgian shepherd trained for trail scenting and he won't work with any other handler. That's Cedric. That's my main man. Come on, get out. Come on, we go trailer. Um, He's an amazing search dog, very challenging, but he's just so good in what he does. Uh, he goes through a f- town centre full of people and he just follows that once and till he f- concludes it. Wow. Yeah. And how many hours of training do you reckon you and Cedric have done together? I can't rely me. I just can't. <sighs> Thousands of hours. You know when people talk about this and say, oh, this once-in-a-lifetime dog? And, yeah, that's probably him. Dogs are clearly the first domestic species, plant or animal. And that relationship we know was absolutely well underway 8,000, 10,000 years ago and possibly as early as 15. And there are some people out there who think that it may have been underway as early as 20 or 30,000 years ago even. Professor Gregor Larson is a bioarchaeologist at Oxford University. So this is a time when modern homo sapiens are are living in bands where they're hunter-gathering, you know, we're foraging from the land... What do you think that first step was in our our relationship with dogs? There are a couple of different camps. One of the camps thinks that people would rescue or capture wolf puppies and bring them into a human settlement and then slowly begin to tame them. And then that's the process by which we ended up with modern dogs. Another group which thinks that the initial phases of the process were much more unintentional and probably had more to do with a kind of emergent process whereby a pack of wolves started getting used to hanging out with people and 
vice versa. And then slowly that pack of wolves started separating off from a variety of other wolves. And then they become actively associated with people uh, when we're hunting things. And then, of course, their use just goes to the roof. And then since then, we've been finding a million things that they can do for us, uh, much to our shared benefit. This is my pet dog, Harpo, a nine-year-old chocolate Labrador with big golden eyes, floppy ears and a love of belly scratches and chewing on bones. I love him a lot. We've tried obstacle races, obedience tests and we go hiking and camping together. Perhaps we're tapping into our deep ancestral bond, Homo sapiens and Canis familiaris, hanging out, just like we have for more than ten millennia. What a clever dog! What a clever donkey! What a clever fur monkey! Oh, let you! We've trained dogs to detect cancer, alert their owners before an epileptic fit or diabetic episode, and they've helped rehabilitate people who've had strokes. Trained dogs find guns, drugs, bombs and bodies, and hundreds of millions of pet dogs give their owners joy every day. This is Mitzpah. He's a border collie, much loved, quite a rascal, and goes with me almost everywhere. Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg lives in London with his family and pet dog Mitzpah. He's written a book called Things My Dog Has Taught Me About Being a Better Human. The more I thought about it, the more I realised that what I was writing about were also the connections between people. Themes like faithfulness, kindness, cruelty, welcome, listening, asking, illness, grief and loss. And that obviously the dog is very much part of what I write. But if I was writing about my experiences as a rabbi trying to care for a community over many years, a lot of the things I wrote would be focusing on the same emotions, same struggles. Do you think your dog has made you a a better person, a, a better rabbi? I think so. I think I've been made more alert and more aware and I hope more sensitive. I mean, just on a basic level, that when are we going to go for a walk look which dogs give you? And sometimes at, you know, I've been in this area of Kenwood at midnight with him and at first you think, oh, it's cold, do I have to? And then you go out and you see the moon and you're among the trees late at night and it's wonderful. It deepens the appreciation of life. They're next of kin, in a way, in the sense that kin is about kindness and closeness. Yeah, when um, people say, oh, but it's just a dog, I think, oh, you don't know, do you? You don't know, it's never just a dog. I agree. I mean, I I don't equate the complexity and the range and the fullness of relationship with a fellow human being with a relationship with a dog, but it's it's never just a dog. Do dogs have any sort of cognitive or an emotional capacity that makes them stand apart? Do they really understand us in the way that we think? I think dogs have become very good at making us think that they understand us. Dogs can understand our gestures and read human emotional states by combining information from our faces and voices. When our faces and voices give conflicting signals, dogs get confused. It's a cognitive ability that's only previously been found in primates. But there are limits. When you come home and you admonish your dog for peeing on the carpet or knocking over the bin or whatever it is, it will do the thing where it kind of looks away at you and then looks down and furls its eyebrows a little bit and you feel like it's expressing guilt. That's just a learned response. It's Whether or not there's a guilt underlying that is very much been recently called into question. And not to say that dogs aren't capable of an emotional range of reactions. It's just that the way inter- we interpret them, we tend to anthropomorphize to such a degree that then we ascribe to them capabilities and reactions that we would do with our own children. And we do that almost for our own benefit in a way because that reinforces what we believe to be this phenomenal relationship and thereby we make it real. At the very minimum, what it's doing is it's increasing our empathy for animals in the natural world and rather than setting up this dichotomy between an us and them or humans at the top of some sort of evolutionary ladder, I think what this is really demonstrating is that evolution has been working on us for three and a half billion years as well as our dogs. For most of our shared lives, dogs served a function, helping us hunt or guard livestock or property. 
dogs that are purely companion animals, pets, are a relatively new phenomenon, and it's not one that's universal. Of the one billion dogs in the world, the majority aren't cared for and don't have a name. If they are set apart from other animals, it's not always in a good way. So the dominant view today by Muslims and non-Muslims is that Islam considers dogs impure. Dr. Alan Mikhail is a historian of the early modern Muslim world at Yale University. He says the place of dogs in Islamic culture has a much more complex, nuanced history than most people realise. So there are prophetic reports that say if a dog touches a container, that this container has to be washed out uh, several times, and there's some dispute here, using dust, only using water, using a combination of the two. There are other reports that talk about if a dog touches the garment of an individual, that that has to be cleaned somehow. You have others that say the saliva of a dog is not a problem at all. There are some that say the prophet prayed in the presence of dogs. There are some Muslim theologians who will say that anything in nature, because nature is created by God, is pure. Why is there such a focus on dogs rather than other animals? That's a good question. One of the reasons is that dogs were everywhere. Muslims up until very recently, like most people up until very recently, and by very recently, I mean, say, you know, 1800, lived in rural societies where dogs were important for herding, for hunting, for protection. Even those who lived in cities also interacted with dogs on a fairly regular basis. Dogs, again, in cities provided protection. And they also served the very important function of keeping cities clean by eating refuse, by eating waste. In fact, throughout the Middle Ages, dogs featured in Muslim morality tales which celebrated their value, their bravery, devotion and hard-working nature. Quite often, the dogs in the stories behaved better than the humans. So there is a king, OK, in medieval Iraq who is a renowned hunter and has a very uh, valued hunting dog. So he returns one day from a long day of hunting and is very hungry. So he goes to prepare himself for dinner. The dog is left outside and the dog observes the cook making the dinner. So for dinner, they're making this kind of uh, soup porridge. And when the cook turns his back, a snake comes into the cooking area and poisons the porridge unbeknownst to the cook, but the dog sees this. So the cook serves the porridge as, as normal, and only the dog now knows that this is poisoned, and so starts barking, et cetera, et cetera, and the king's attendants say, you know, t take the dog away so that the king can eat, you know, his dinner in peace. And they're taking the dog out. The dog um, wrestles himself free, comes, overturns the porridge, and laps it up and dies on the spot. And then the king comes to realize that the porridge had been poisoned and that the dog saved his life. So the lesson is that the cook allows the king's porridge to be poisoned and therefore the king to be poisoned and that the dog both saves and sacrifices himself for the king. That's a, a tragic and beautiful story. So there's, there's <laughs> kind of... The, so the principle is that dogs are loyal, that they'll yes. sacrifice themselves. yes. And do you think that association of dogs eating the garbage on the streets, did that kind of fuel the idea that dogs are unclean, that they're dirty, and that if you want to go and pray, if you want to keep your, your clothes, your vessels clean, you don't touch a dog's mouth? Yes. I, I mean, I think in the 19th century, that does come to play a role. Because also garbage is removed from cities, some of the productive functions of dogs are taken away from them. And as more people moved to urban areas, working, farm and hunting dogs were less common as well. Historically, that's the point where we see dogs creeping towards taboo. So in, in this moment in which, you know, garbage is removed from cities and dogs are pushed out of cities, is the first time that we have widespread human violence against dogs. So in cities like Cairo and Istanbul, dogs are rounded up in various moments and either shipped off to sea and drowned or killed in some other way. So that, that's an important indication of a changing moment in the, in the human-dog relationship. My dog, Harpo, is regularly found nose-deep in filth. I once chased him up a hill as he tried to run off with maggot-ridden sheep entrails he'd found. 
There's no denying that dogs are dirty, smelly and sometimes really disgusting. Are you looking me in the face, you dirty doggy? Ooh, what are you doing? Ooh, Ooh you smell like fish. <laughs> but I still let him sleep on our bed and sit on the sofa with me. Studies have shown that stroking a pet releases oxytocin, the so-called loving hormone, and inhibits adrenaline and cortisol, the stress hormones. Quality time with a dog, if you like dogs, can also lower blood pressure, reduce the risk of depression and even help patients recover from cancer treatment. But in some places, Harpo would be more prized for his other features. It's very different from pork. It's a special taste to the dog meat lovers. Dog meat has a special fragrance. It's very tasty. Some people call it fragrance meat. <laughs> Zhao Nanyuan is a retired professor in Beijing who passionately defends his right to eat dog. In some places, this is a very, very old tradition from ancient China. People think eating dog meat is really nutritious, especially in the winter. There are many places in China that breed dogs for their meat. In rural areas, people might breed dogs as guard dogs, but at some point, they might decide to eat their dogs. That's not a problem. Dogs are descended from wolves. The idea that they are man's best friend doesn't make sense. Maybe because the Westerners think everything is created by God. They think maybe God created the dogs to be human's best friend. But we Easterners don't think so. Go to the 2,000-year-old tomb of Emperor Jingdi in Xi'an and you can see terracotta models of hunting dogs and eating dogs. They have pointy ears, curly tails and stocky, meaty bodies. Chinese dog-eating garners a lot of international attention, mostly negative, partly because of accusations that the dogs on the butcher's block are often stolen pets and that these social, smart animals are badly treated. Some protesters, though, think that eating dogs is morally wrong on principle. Dogs just shouldn't be eaten. It's a strange thing. Everybody should have the right to choose what to eat and what not to eat. They shouldn't interfere with other people's choices. If there is an Indian person who is Hindu and says, hey, we are Hindus and we don't eat beef, so you shouldn't eat beef either, what would you think? When people breed or train dogs, they have a special purpose in mind. Sheep dogs, hunting dogs, pet dogs. Why can't they be bred to be eaten? If you decide only one of these is the correct way, it's just not right. Estimates suggest actually only around 2% of Chinese have eaten dog meat. And I regularly eat other clever animals like pigs, so maybe I should eat dog. Whatever culture we're in, we categorise the world into groups in order to create social logic. The world can be split into categories like human-animal, wild, domestic or pet, and by extension, edible or inedible. If we think of and treat dogs as friends or family members, then they don't sit comfortably in the edible category. Because, well, you don't eat family. We tell them, you smell the land... You find the mines, you sit, and they touch uh, gently with the nose. Gevazin is a dog trainer in Israel. Fifteen years ago, he was deployed to the Balkans in Eastern Europe to help detect and clear landmines. We walked there with uh, ten dogs, and I saw that the dogs don't like to smell in the land. To try to recognise the mines, it's very difficult for them. But I saw many, many pigs in the village we walked. And the pigs, all the day, from the morning until the evening, they smell in the land, a digging with the nose. And that gave him an idea. And I said, when I come back to Israel, I tried to train pigs to recognize the landmines. We saw that the pigs very, very clever. They like the job, much better of the dogs. And the eyes look like a human being. She look in you, and she know what you want, and she listen to you. The pigs were so gentle that even if they touched a mine, it wouldn't detonate. They worked hard, didn't tire as quickly, and were extremely reliable. But when Geva tried to offer the services of his trained pigs to international landmine clearance teams, he was rebuffed. Angola didn't want pigs, 
they wanted dogs. The teams in Croatia and Serbia wanted dogs. And the Israeli forces didn't want to work with pigs because they're considered unclean in Judaism. So the project was terminated. And what about service dogs? Training a guide dog to help someone with visual disabilities costs around $45,000 US dollars and most retire after around six or seven years' service. For the same cash, you could train a guide horse and expect around 20 years' faithful service. Yes, actual miniature horses. A no-brainer, you say. But our species-based expectations mean a lot of folk consider a horse in the office a bit too left field. So service dogs are still top dog. Back in Essex... This is what we oh, call a proximity alert, what you see now. Yeah. She knows her target is somewhere. Hey! Really? Yeah. And there's a person sitting <laughs> under a bush in the middle of a woodland. Good girl! So that last 20 yards, yeah. you've been dragged through the yeah, woods. Yeah. Because she knows he's there. Right. And the incentive is there. To, so she knows she gets a reward. And now she's got a tutor. Because she's not interested in the person, really. She's just interested in the game and the hunt. Brilliant. Hold on, Jaeger. <laughs> you don't realise, but you're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> How important do you think the domestication of the dog is in, in terms of understanding our human history? I'm not sure that we could overstate it, really. What it does is it completely changes the way in which humans interact and perceive the natural world. I mean, if you consider that our species is somewhere between 200 and 300,000 years old, that most of that time we are a species existing, as you describe, as hunter-gatherers, moving around a landscape, taking advantage of seasonally available resources and living in relatively small bands. Dogs change all that. Dogs somehow have had this phenomenally plastic ability to learn how to do things for us that we are only still exploring, and they continue to be helpful to us in, in a myriad of ways. Alan Scott Harper's cheese. And obviously Harper wants a cheese. <laughs> you want this, do you? <laughs> so what Alan is doing, we all climb over this log first. OK. You've been listening to The Y Factor on the BBC World Service. I'm Marianne O'Hotter. The producer was Gabriella Jones and our editor is Andrew Smith. So we wind him up, watch him. Oh, where's he going, mate? Where's he going? He's got the cheese. Watch him. Watch him and the cheese. You can listen to other Y Factors on immortality, self-marriage and pets in general on our website. And here's a last test for my hound Harpo. Search dog in uh, training. Go get him. And here goes Harpo and gets his cheek. <laughs> Harpo, you found the cheese man! <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Y Factor. If you'd like to listen to more from the BBC, head to the website. You can download a wide range of other documentaries at www.bbc.com.